Right, Dean Neil. <laughs> I don't like when you say my name like that. <laughs> I mean, when I'm in trouble normally. <laughs> well, it's Mr. Neil. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening, Mark? You Mate, good? thank you so much for coming on to Let's Talk. Uh, what a pleasure. And a pleasure. Uh, listen, what a journey it's been for you. The traditional bricklayer. <laughs> it's just gone crazy, <laughs> hasn't it? Yeah, Joe, you know, first and foremost, listen, I'm so happy to be on here, Mark, because you obviously started your journey on this. Yeah. And to be asked to come on at the start, when well, I know it's going to grow, is uh, a compliment. So thank you very much, my man. No, thanks for taking the time to come. But, you know, look, before we get into where you are at the moment with the traditional bricklayer, yep. you used to be pretty big in football, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't like to use that term. <laughs> Bit of a big fish. Uh, yeah. Yeah, always have been. You know, ever since a young kid, um, saying I've grown up with, um, with my football, my passion. Um, there's a big story behind it, and that's why I've come on today. And um, hopefully, with my words, my life experiences, up and downs, people can take from it, whether it be ten percent, twenty percent, or something good. You know, let the world hear it. So, how did it start for you? What was the? I'm guessing most people have a passion for sport anyway. I've yeah. always had a passion for sport. Running's my thing. You know, we've always enjoyed running and that. Football must have been quite a big passion for you as a child. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm a, a Canning Towner, East London, born and bred, you know. Two things come out of Canning Town, Mark. A gentleman or a footballer. <laughs> or if you want to name the third thing, a bank robber. <laughs> 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 I've been part of all three. So... Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, for, from a young age, um, it was all football. That's all we ever knew. Football, football and fighting. That's all we'd done in London, you know, on the streets. And um, you become a product of your environment. Um, the talent around me at such a young age, which I didn't know then, which you become more aware of as you get older, was just uh, ridiculous. But to be truthful, Mark, it was a place where I could go and forget about my problems. Even as a young kid, um, I didn't know normality because you don't as a kid. Um, the fighting, the, the home struggles, you know, just family life. You don't know what's right and what's wrong. You don't know. I know now that, that was wrong as a kid, how I was um, brought up or treated, shall we say. Um, so when I went football, that was a time everything went and I could be me, express myself, take my anger, aggression out, you know, and compete. And I found that useful from the age of seven, eight years old. Um, and it, and that, and that moulded me, you know, that, that university, that school life then, you know, that 100% moulded me through who I am today. So that you, you're saying about your difficult times in home life, yeah, and that what what were the difficult times there? Uh, do you know what? I, I, it's wrong of me to indulge in it too much, um, out of respect for family members and stuff like that. But um, I didn't have, you know, I was never tucked in overnight. I don't. I didn't know love. I thought it was normal. I thought that's what it was because you don't as a kid. Mm. You know, I had to call me mum and dad by their first names. You know, I, I, it wasn't, um, it wasn't an upbringing. A it wasn't up a maternal upbringing. Yeah, it mm. was, I was on, I spent a lot of time alone, mm. a lot of time alone. Now, you, like I said, you don't know that as a youngster. You can't work that out. You think it's a norm. You don't know what love is. You don't know what a, a kiss goodnight is. Because if you're not at it, yeah. you don't know what it is. Now, what happened was, uh, coming out of London, everyone's goal is to get out of East London, is to fight, is to get out. And that's why you see many successful people come out of East London. Poverty produces, that's what they say. But on the same note, my mum was trying her best to give us a better, get us out of London, which you can agree with, you know, but she was gone out the house from half six in the morning to half six seven at night which for a seven year old to be alone mm. to look after himself is a big task now sometimes mark if you're going to get out of london and you go after him to make a better life 
let's not forget the essentials. You know, family life, watching your kid play football, being there, giving him a home-cooked dinner when he comes in from school, picking him up from school, buying him sweets, being at the school play. So I missed out on all that because we were striving to get out of there. But at the same time, I would sacrifice a, a Bentley for to come home from school, be picked up at school, you know, sweets. So at a young age, I thought that was a norm. You know, I had to um, produce my own responsibility, take responsibility as a young man. The decisions I made, I had no guidance. Uh, my old man was in and out of Nick. He was, uh, listen, a, a lot of guys, that generation, very big, the old bank robberies, post office, jewelers. It was big in them days. You mm. get, you know, it was almost a fashion, the police, and it was easy to get away with. A lot of people come out of Canning Town, were involved somewhere along the line. My old man was in and out of Nick. You just see him here and there. Um, Did you have brothers and sisters then? Yeah, I've got a brother. Got a brother, chalk and cheese, Mark. Chalk and cheese. Really? Yeah, chalk and cheese. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I don't, I've not spoke to none of my family members uh, for 20 plus years now. You know, I made a decision to go solo. Now, as a kid, Mark, you spend a lot of time alone and you're thinking and like, you got to pass the time. And I used to play board games alone. I used to play like Mousetrap, mm -hmm. Monopoly on my own. Um, and I'll think about that now. And a lot of people watching this probably thinking, oh, like, but don't, because what it was building was resilience, power. It was building the man, that enthusiasm for me to just not sit there and go mad because I'm alone. Because even at a young age, you feel lonely. I used to play board games. I used to listen to music and write down the words. And that's to take up quite a lot of time. Um, and without me knowing it, that was building my resilience, my drive, my ambition. That was building the man. And it's a hard way, you know. Um, but it's, I look, it's like, for example, I didn't have no money. We had no money, you know. Uh, I was left with, like, no money to go all day some days. And I'm not bad math for anyone. I'll get what family done to do this or do that. So then it come forth the hour of the man, you know. The man had to react. I, I couldn't go without money. I was going out with mates. They were going swimming. I couldn't go. What, they, I, what age was you here, Dean? 10, right. 9, 10. Couldn't go, go to the local sweet shop. I just said, I don't want to go because I had no money and I felt embarrassed because my mates feel obliged to have been buying me sweets or sharing with me and I felt a burden on them. So then I was going, oh, I'm going home, you know? And then it come to the point where I couldn't live like that no more, Mark. I had to go out and earn money, you know? And from a young age, me, um, I had to think outside the box and and that's what I've done. I started taking a, a few bad turns, using my initiative, and um, started earning a bit of money and to pay for the necessities, my sweets, just to go swimming. So when you say you took a bad turn, you mean you sort of went on the other side? Yeah. Um, at the age of 10, 11, I was quite well known for having a tear up, mm. you know. Um, with me, I was brought up, and the way I brought myself up is... Show respect, whether you win, lose, or draw, do not back down. So if there was a straightening with a boy, I would give it my win. Now, when you've got that mindset as an 11-year-old kid, I don't care if I win, lose, or draw, that's a winning mindset because mm. you're having a go no matter what. You fear nothing because you're accepting if you lose, you're accepting if you draw, and you're accepting if you win. But a lot of the mindsets are brought up to win, and when they don't win, then they come, oh, I don't fancy this tear up. This boy looks a bit bigger than me. They start to pick and choose. But when your mindset is win, lose, or draw, bomb. And uh, I'll tell you a particular time. I, where, where I come from, I sort of wish the old ways were brought back. If someone took liberties, it was dealt with within the community. 
So I'll give you a time. There was an old boy down down the pub, uh, Les. He was probably sixty five. Irish lad, white vest, walking around with his guard up. And he was a, he was a nuisance, Mark, but harmless. But he was a character. And uh, some geezers filled him in. Took really bad liberties with him. And um, me and a few of the other lads around the manor were, were quite well known. And then we was offered to go and sort him out. And that was loads of cliches, you know. Chuck the ball over the garden, find out where he lives. Go knock on the front door. While we knocked on the front door, he would come to the front door. Two, three of us would jump the wall. Excuse me, missed them balls, going in the garden, going it back. Oh, fucking hell. He'd go in the garden, as soon as he went in the garden, it's closed off on it. We'd fill him in, job done. We'd get paid. Now, 10 pound then is a lot of dough. He was new kid on the block, you know? The other one was, uh, you'd go knock on the door, excuse me, mister, I think, like, I've just seen mate hit your car. Because you had to get him out the ass. He'd come out the ass and the geezer would take over. And it was all going down the wrong road. But it was enjoyable. I was earning money. I wasn't uh, a prisoner anymore to um, poverty. I could go to the sweet shop. I could do this, I could do that. And I'll tell you a story quickly, and it stayed with me the rest of my life. I set up a little cleaning business. We all lived in tower blocks. We used to clean landings. We knock on your doors, you want your landing clean, love? How much? 50p or a pound of a new mat. So we had buckets. And uh, what we used to do, we used to go to the tower block opposite, nick their doormat, give it to the new person, but take their doormat and take it back to the old person. So morally, we was all right. You know, it wasn't <laughs> such a bad thing. So it wasn't thieving, we were just borrowing a bit. So one doormat could go between 15 flats, Mark. <laughs> 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 right. So anyway, we, we was cleaning these landings and we was on an earner. Me and my mate, JJ, right, 50p a landing. Bleach, clean it down, lovely. Because you come out your flat in London, you, your front door, and you have a little landing. It was all always clean and sharp. Now, we developed, and I started taking my other mate on. Before I knew it, we had like three, four buckets. We had a little firm. I was only about 11 then, right? And uh, I used to go to the sweet shop, Mark, right? I mean, picture this being young. You know the tubs of the mix-ups? Yeah, yeah. Penny mix-ups? yeah. I used to buy the fucking box. So the gal in there penny pinching, buying five and suck them as long as I could to last, I was going and buying the box, right? But there's only so many sweets you can eat because you feel sick. Mm. So then I would go in the playground because I knew how it was to be and I'd give them out to all the other kids who didn't have sweets, you know? But by doing that, I gained popularity. Not that I'm meant to do that, I was just being nice. So then my pop, hey, even the older kids were coming down. If you get in trouble, Dane, come and see us, because that's what it was like. And I was bowling. So, um, I was summer, right? I've come in, my old man sitting on my bed. And my old man was uh, loving my rating of what he'd done. He, he had a bit about him, an aura, you know. He sat on my bed, and he said, son, come here. I stood in front of him. He went, empty your pockets. I thought, fuck. I'm like a fruit machine, Mark. I've got 50 P's loaded up. And uh, I looked at it. What? He went, empty your pockets. Oh, fucking. I'm willingly empty my pockets. I'm climbing all these 50 P's. I put them on the bed. <laughs> and he looked down and he looked up and he said, uh, where's you get the money from? Well, I found it, Dad. <laughs> He just lays through me. And you know, you, you tell a lie and you're trying to, I went, yeah, well, I was down the uh, street and uh, I fair. He went, I'm going to ask you again, son. Where'd you get the money from? Dad, honestly, I found it. With that, he must lift me up. His bang, with a slap. The dry slap man in the head. You know when you've had a fresh trim as well? And he's like, <laughs> fuck him. Stood there. Stand up, son. I stood back up. Because when the old man hit me, he couldn't go down. He to, if you went down, you had to get back up again. That was his thing. Do you know what, as you say that now, it opens up a lot of yeah. who I am. Where'd you get the fucking dad that whack? So I thought, fuck it, hell, I've got to stick to my story or cave in here. I'm not going to cave in. And he said, look at me, son. Tell me where you got the money from. And I explained to him about the business. 
and that. And I stopped, and he fucking whacked me again. So that's free now. And I was like, that. when my dad whacked me, I was fucking, he could tell I wouldn't ever go back. Like, I wouldn't have discipline and respect. And he went to me, son, never let the left hand out of the right hand's doing. And he looked at me. You know what you've done? He said, you've given the fucking big one, walking around. And that's when you get in trouble. Now what had happened is, Mo, the Asian guy in the shop, see me old man, said to him, again, I think Saints going on, your boy's coming in with a lot of dough, buying a lot of sweets. So what my old man was implying to me, where I was being flash, that's how I got caught. Mm. If I'd have gone in and kept buying me 10, 20p mix-ups, or even mm. use other people to go and buy them, I wouldn't have brought attention to myself. And that comes from the criminal world. <laughs> you know, I didn't know that then, but he was right. And, I, and that advice, Mark, goes on through life, because people can be very jealous. If you're doing well, you know, they're, they will pick at you or they, they're a bad man for you. And I think at a young age as well, Dean, obviously we, you know, as children, we crave love. Mm. Even us as grown men, you yeah. know. <laughs> My wife always tells me, she went, all of you guys, you're just little boys that just want to cuddle and just want to be loved. Yeah, yeah. And it's true, because we do, yeah. you know, in a, in a big amount of worry. And, and that's, that is a lot to do with upbringing as well. If that's something that you've that missed... Yeah, the thing and is, something that you crave. So maybe you know, in a roundabout way, you giving these lovely sweets out to all these young young people that don't yeah. get that uh, ability to be able to have that. They're yeah. showing you some affection and, and showing yeah. you some love. You yeah, one hundred percent. Do you know what? Um, I say this all the time. Um, I think personally, if you've not had that love, you know what love is. Mm. So if I say to a girl now, I love you. I fucking, she don't even know the meaning of that word, how much I mean in that word for mm. me to say that. Because that means real. Because for someone, it sometimes you've not been there unless you've been there. If yeah. you've been skint, you know what it's like to fucking work yourself up from the bottom. You don't want to go back there. So the same with that word love. Now, from that young age, I was a man, Mark. You know, I was in a, I was in a little gang, we were working for little firms. You know, it was getting naughty. Mm. But one thing I had, what my old man inbred in me from that left hand, right hand, was to have a brain between your ears. And there was times I stood down because powers got too heavy and I knew where this was going. And there was no arm in standing down. But to go through all that as a young kid and to keep it quiet, so I was very elusive. I got popularity, people knew. But I didn't go around giving the big one, you know. And the problem with that was when you go in a football world and you've got little Jimmy, who comes from a four-bedroom house in Essex, well bought up, calls you a prick, you'd fill him in. Because mm. you use that word, that means fighting. Because where I come from, that is a... Just, just understand where I'm going with Yeah, this. yeah, of course, yeah. And, and people were like... and You had to separate. Not everyone was the same as you. And sometimes I was deemed as being over the top. So I was going in a football world where people were having an opinion. Now, the, 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 the problem I struggled with here, I brought my... The decisions I made, Mark, were my decisions. Some failed, some were successful, but I learned from them. No one guided me because my old man went and then my mum was gone, and from a young age, I was off living alone. So the decisions I made had to be right for me. Now, when you've got making them decisions, you become 99% right all the time. Because if I have an argument, I look at it from their view. Why are they getting upset? I can see their point of view, you know, before I reply. Mm. Whereas not people just, ah, this, that, argue back. But I see that, I go, listen, I understand where you're coming from. You're thinking this about that, what I've done here. This is the reason I've done it. Think about that one. And it, it, you become so headstrong, but also stubborn. Now, in a football game, this, that, you know, I say this now at, um, at an age. 
I'm not going to name them. There's people in the Premier League, people play for big clubs, Man United, Man City, Chelsea, who was not a patch on me and some of my pals when we were younger. But for Christmas, we was getting a new Sergio Tassini track suit. They were getting a West Ham shirt, new home kit. They had more commitment and application than we did. Mm. Not the talent. And they worked with that commitment and application. And in the football world, that's, you know, it. I've just become so of a loose cannon. The discipline. Because I've brought myself up, made my own decisions. When I've got a fella telling me, uh, Dean, you need to be doing this, it's not good enough, you know. But mate, you have me fucking laugh, geezer. You know, and I couldn't take that authority. What age was you when you got uh, into football properly? And oh. how? And and who sort of guided you into into that way as well? Myself. You, yourself, yeah? Yeah. Picked up a pair of gloves in the street, fucking died around like a madman, you know? Um, but who picked you up? Someone must have scouted you to, yeah, to say that, you know, I, you've I got a bit of potential. It's playing in the street. Mate, you come up to me, uh, a boy called Daniel, uh, I won't say his name, second name. My old man runs a team, I need a keeper, why don't you come over? Play there. I think I played three games if I was picked up for my district, my pro club. Like, I look back now, Mark, even to when I retired five years ago, I make saves you ain't seen before, people haven't seen before, and that's not me being arrogant. That was just my mindset, the way I could read and perceive things. And I think that come from my younger years. Whatever I was doing was thought out. We did, listen, we can't get caught. We can't do this. I'd risk assess. So in football, I just become like um, a very good observer. And I got picked up by uh, Cholton. And I didn't sign at Cholton first. It was a good eight weeks. And I think I'd only played about four actual games. And then before I knew it, other clubs were coming in, you know, and um, it just went from there. But, you know, I had opportunities I missed. I took myself everywhere, in London, buses, underground trains. I never had no family come to watch me, you know. And I'm not playing the violin but I think back now I didn't know no different it was just what it was mm. like Mark you got a county trial you're playing your first professional uh, academy game everyone's got their families there I turn up got 15 buses left 4 hours before everyone else no one knows that you know and it's hard and I think if I had guidance then it would be a complete different story. Because mm. I just had the ability just to turn just to turn it on. Uh, just to interrupt you for a second, I just wanted to tell you quickly about our sponsor for the podcast, Fountains Media. Fountains Media is a creative content first media agency. We create videos, we do your photography for you, we've got a CAA approved drone pilot, and we offer full social media management. So you don't have to ever worry about when or what to post. Anyway, look, sorry to interrupt your podcast, but if you do want to check them out, check out all their socials. That is Fountains Media. I went with a child sat then. I've got three buses. I come from London. I've got a train, three buses. Geezer turns out, well-known coach. I got there and the boys are running around. They've had a kick about balls. It says to me, uh, you're late. And I said, yeah, I've got two, three buses. He said, go clear the balls up and then join the group. I said, fuck you, you know, in them words. Like, what? I said, what are you saying? I was really filling in, Mark. He said, get him off the pitch, some fucking gang, you prick. And I went. And I'd done that two, three times with different clubs. Mm. Um, I just, I, I had a fire in me. And if someone could have got hold of that fire, I, did, I only know that now, because I'm older. <laughs> But then, because I knew, I fucking sat, there'd be another club. I could pick and choose. And, um, yeah, that, that's, that's how football went, you know. Um, but it really kicked off for you, didn't it? Because you, you played, like, a, an unbelievable level. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, 
I mean, you played in fucking Real Madrid. You you played in some incredible places. Yeah, I think it took you as quite a good career, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely, hundred percent. Because when I focus upon it, and the more I got older, the more I got more wiser, you know. Um, and things happen for a reason. I'm a firm believer in your path. Now, let's get this. Right. I'm talking about my younger years. Because I'm trying to make people understand, coaches will watch this, scouts, and they all go like, he should have been here, should have been there. You become a product of your environment. Mm. Not just me. I've got seven, ten pals who've done ten stretches, fifteen stretches, who were quality. But we just all we was in we was brought up to be resilient and hard, but then expected to be obedient and disciplined. Do you see what I mean? Two don't come together. Conflict to get, of interest. Yeah. yeah. And mm. as a young male, the hormones, mm. testosterone's running. It, it, yeah, it's, it just doesn't go together. And I think in foot, I've never been involved in football, only with stuff that I've done with you for the coaching. Yeah. But I imagine there's a lot of egos in football as well, is there? Oh, all the time. The fucking hell. Like, Mark, honestly, drop me out some of the kids. They think they're fucking nine out of tens. They're not their fours. I've run rings around them mm. and their age. So will I be pals, you know? Even now I'll tell you a story now, right? I'm not going to name his name. A top striker, played for West Ham United, played for England, right? We was in the dressing room at uh, 15 years old. He come in, half time, we're 2 1 down. Our gaffy said, let us go in and just kick off between ourselves because we were strong personalities. And then he'd come in five minutes later, we'll have our little saying, this lad is on trial. To see you, you're taking the fucking piss, lad. You need to dig deep. You're getting smashed out there, boy. Everything's coming in here, it's bouncing off you. You got Ed like a 50 pence piece. What's fucking going on? Two other lads. Fucking, you want to play with this team, boy? You better line them up. And this is like 15 year old kids. Mm. He sat down, and he cried. Then um, we all carried on between ourselves. No one put our man in, left him. And then our skipper at the time said, fuck it, he nearly went for him. You crying, you pussy, we're fucking losing 2-1. That ain't the fucking answer. Boom, boom, all got broke up. That gazer went on to be a figure at West Ham and England. And that's one of them. I can probably name five here mm. who didn't have the minerals. But I'm not saying it's good, it's, it's, it's the right thing to do, but I'm just saying, brought up in that environment, we're brought up one way, and expected to be another way, and it doesn't go. No. Um, so what happened was, uh, football was going good. Uh, 15, 16, Charlton, you know, signing YTS back then. Um, scholarship. Custy. Um, and then as confident as I was, you know, during the week I was out with the ladies, you know, my pals, doing me a little bit. Um you go into the change room, Mark. Right? I'm a signed player. I've got the track suit. I've got the kit. You walk into the change room, there's a civvy lad. What we mean by that is in normal clothes. He's back. You know he's a trialist. So I'd sit down, get in chains, banter with the boys. And no matter how strong and confident I was, I'm looking to see if he pulls a pair of gloves out of his bag. Because I know he's going to be a keeper on trial. And then he would. He'd be like, fuck, sake, what have I got to do? to prove my worth here. Mm. You know, I'm playing well with these. They've brought another lad on trial. Then I've been attacked the fucking piss. I wouldn't try and go home. But yeah, um, couldn't give a fuck. Fuck the club. Not to mention now, no, now, that boy played a weldy the week before. He deserved to be there. Mm. He had a great game. He deserved to give a treat. But I took it personal. I couldn't accept, you know. So, that was going on. Mark, what you eat on a Tuesday affects your performance on a Saturday. It's full time. When people say, oh, these players are on too much money, they don't understand the, the mental side of it. If you have a bad game on a Saturday, you're trying to put it behind you. But the money now has got fucking ridiculous, surely. Yeah, but Mark, look at, you haven't, look at the protocol. You cannot go out and be seen in But there's clubs. no other industry. There's no other, other than American football yeah. and baseball and stuff, other than anything in the USA, but here in, the, in, in England. So yeah. I, I know Tony Gale. Yeah, yeah. And I remember him saying when he played for West Ham, yeah. he was on £3,000 a month. Yeah. And I know that's in the 80s and 90s, yeah. that's probably quite good money. But in comparison to what they get paid now, like he's kicking himself. <laughs> 
yeah, absolutely well, kicking it. He said, I'm just fucking in the wrong era, you know? Yeah, 100%. Exactly the same as me. But yeah. do you know what, Mark? I work with a lot of that contract pros and it's hard game. You cannot go out drink. You're, they're on you, the media. Oh, of course. Look how social media is now. Yeah, they yeah. can ruin your family. If you're yeah. caught talking to a girl, they'll make a mountain out of it. Shippers, your career can be ruined. You are told to be just disciplined. And that's a hard life to live. Especially when, like, what I struggled with, when you've got a pool with a certain group of lads who are out drinking gaps and no good skullduggery, you know, the birds, and you're trying to be that person, it's hard. So this is my, my next point. This is what happened to me. Now, you turn up on a Monday, done a mistake on a Saturday, the coach, Dean, we've got to work for your mistake, rehearse it. And you can't wait for the next game to put it right. The psychological pressure is immense. Dealing with trialists, you know, dealing with the next training session, dealing with the next game, the nutrition, your application. And then one off-season, my mate phoned me up. He said, uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm oh, just chilling. He said, do you fancy uh, coming to work? Me old man. His old man was a bricklayer. And I said, uh, I'm not doing anything else. He said, Dean's cush, Dean's sweet. He's cashing out in blah, blah, blah. I went, all right. So I went, so I went to work, Mark. Right. And uh, I was doing conservatories. And I turned up. And I kid you not, I couldn't fucking believe it. There's these two big lads, cut down Levi's, nice short, sun was out, music was playing, and I just couldn't comprehend. These were happy. And I was looking at it and I was like, the cups of tea's coming and I laughed at working. And that day went into another day and I stayed, kept staying and paid at the end of the week cash. And I looked at their life, I sat down, and I was like, what I said earlier, I was very good with my head. Sat down and I thought, They've got no pressure. The pressure I'm dealing with to what they've got. Who's got this right and who's got it wrong? And then to top it off, one of the brick lads was an ex-pro footballer and he dropped down into the semi-professional game. He pulled me aside. He went, fuck that, Dino. He said, do not let your career lay on one person's decision. That one coach, you may not like you, and will release you. And he said, get yourself a trade, build yourself a good foundation. Get into non-league football. He said, Dean, I'm picking up two, three hundred quid a week. He said, get in non-league football, it's a shop window. Do that while you're getting your trade. And when you've got your trade, if you want to go back into full-time football, you can. And I thought, fuck it. Like, I've got to say, my background's construction. And I think it's the best, without a doubt, the best place anybody can ever be. Yeah. A couple of things. Cut down Levi's. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you don't cut through the pockets. Yeah, Because yeah. everything fucking comes yeah. out from there. <laughs> and the other thing, like what you said, the 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 the, the banter, the camaraderie, the, the everything that goes on with these guys, they're happy. It's funny. Yeah. We now, with the media company, we specialise in construction a lot yeah, of the yeah. time. I fucking love it. It's the best industry to work in. Yeah. Def- Salt the earth. Yeah, Salt the earth. It's man. lovely. Now, look. I'd done that and I made a decision. I thought, I'm going to learn the chart. I looked at these geezers, Mark. They were geezers. They were men. Real men. They took no shit, right? None of this oh, sensitive or whatever. It, they were men. And they were my cup of tea. And they were my idol. I could have had anyone as an idol. I was in a football game. could have had Peter Shilton or whatever. It weren't. It was these two geezers. So... I left football, walked away from it. They took me on as a trail. Can, so just, can you do that in football? Are you not contracted? Or yeah, can you was, just was contracted, it was a little bit over and over, but fucking, what are they going to do? Mm. Send me a present, that's it, my attitude's coming out again. What are you going to do? <laughs> like, I couldn't play with it, I couldn't give a fuck, do you know what I mean? Gave football up, walked away from it, had enough of it, right? Looking at it now, probably the cow would think to do. But I didn't know that then. Because I walked away from the fight. Maybe. I don't know. Anyway. So I learned the trail. And um, I fucking loved it. It was natural to me. It was natural. Now, I was very, very blessed in having a 
some really good role models who took the time to show me. Now, they said, right, on the odds first of all, loading that, and then we're going to teach you the trail. So you've got, there's a process, you've got to learn your stripes. Was this in London still? Yeah. Yeah. And um, on the odd, I was fucking mustard mark on the odd. 12 bricks now, bum, 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 up, you know, pack the bricks 23 minutes, mostly. Other oh, he's been loading up, I'll be doing press ups, you take piss out of them. You have a, it's, everyone used to have a laugh, that's how it was, you know. And then one down a job, I'm working. And I said, the oddies take the piss. They all go slow. I said, geezer, listen to me. You need to get this fucking cracked out, cracked on. So what's the matter with you on day work? I said, you fucking what? I said, I'm running two odds to your one. He said, we're on day work. I fucking smacked him up. I laid him right out. Because that's what it meant. Because these role models were like my family. Mm -hmm. For once, I'd, shown, I'd been shown arm around me and they were willing to show me. And I hadn't had that. They were picking me up at work, Mark. If I didn't have no money, they were buying me sandwiches. One of them's wife used to do me sandwiches. She felt sorry for me. And I didn't know that at the time that she did, but she just, he used to go off, she'd done extra day, you know? So them to me were like fucking family. Mm. So if everyone else tried to mug them off, it weren't happening. So I bet this fucking gays, are not fucking hell, Mark. Local toe rag, and he meant to be a bit tasty. I've turned him off. Um, so my popularity has gone up even more. <laughs> so then when the gang expanded, everyone had time for me. So then the older boys wanted to show me how to do things. Because a bricklayer like, won't teach a youngster to his only stripes. He's got a bad attitude, they won't show him nothing. And that's how I just progressed. And then, it, when the gang got big and it, and it separated another brick lad go can we have Dean for a week I'll go work with him for a week then you might ring up and say I've got, I need Dean for two weeks and I was being passed around so the knowledge and terminology I was learning from these fucking trails were unbelievable was you was you laying or was this like laying before? yeah I just because all I used to do I used to go on the trail Wednesdays and Fridays mm. and um and as I got really good on the trail, some brick lads used to let me go on more, some didn't because I was too valuable on the odd. Mm. Now, what happens in the brick lad game, when you become a good odd carrier and you want to get on the trail, they don't want you off the odd because you're too good. See, I was at a crossroads there to make a decision. Whereas one of the other trails was like, Dean, on the trail, you know? And um, that's what happened. And in the end, um, I had to leave. The bricklayer said to me, then you need to leave, go work with some other people now as a full-time bricklayer. Go on a job, ask for a start, work as a full-time, don't tell them you're an improver. And uh, that's what I've done. Wow, what lovely guys. Yeah. What lovely guys. So they we, trained you up to the point of where, off you go, you're, 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 you're ready. Mark, without even knowing it, even to this day, they set me up for life. Mm. Share me the world's greatest trade. Appreciate your trade, which took a knock over the last few years. Teaching me that. Mark, it's the, name me another trade. We can go anywhere in the world and work. one needs a channel level. A carpenter needs electric. He's cordless saws and generators. Plumbers need all that. Bricklayer's trowel and his level and his lines. That's why it's the oldest trowel is we can remember goes back and they set me up um now combine this talent that i had for land bricks with my fight that i've got i've become a hard very hard man mm. in brick emotionally i mean in brick lane you don't know who you're working with people trying to take the piss out i was young people trying to take the piss out of me you have to identify that so i think by the time i was 20, I'd had well, five five scraps on site, like really good bare knuckle punch like fights. Um, and it propelled my popularity. And then, uh, fucking would you believe it? Job Savile Row, when I make the suits up London. Well, a job at the front, 
Chow knew Chow started. Waiting for the old case to go up, lift. I said to him, look, watch them datums. The datum level marks going around. I said, uh, always get the double check them. He's like, yeah. Fools come down and fucking pop me. You fucking prick, Barry. Who do you think you are? Now, you got to respect every man. You don't talk to a man like that unless you're willing to go. Geezer's fucking uh, Olympian ju judo geezer, any or whatever. Fucking took pride in telling every fucker. So you know he ain't. You know what I mean? Because if you're a true champion, you wouldn't tell people. Mm. It's cut right to me. It's already in my head. This is how I go. I, st I stance up in my head. I'm rehearsing my first three punches before he even said his second word. He said it. Bum, 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 bum. Popped him. He fucking didn't go down, did he? <laughs> Mark, this guy's like a roadblock, right? He must, I reckon he's on one of them fucking mattresses diets. He's mattresses, <laughs> he was that fucking big, right? He fucking hit me, Mark. I flew back about 12 foot. This is at, on Savile Row. All the groundwork was, all paddies. Love it, all took a liking to me. Go on, lad, go on, lad. The fight went on for about a minute, I'd say. It felt like a fucking hour. Anyway, after the fight, he stopped. If anything, I'd say I won. If it was if it was a points decision, it was like a 95 to a 94. It was that close. Mm. But it was a good fucking, really good fight. I fucking got me told. So I thought, I fucked it here. You know, because I got told it, no trouble, Dean. You know what I mean, yeah. on this job. So I went down the corner. There's an alleyway down the bottom of Savile Row. Fucking sat down, a little cry to me. So I thought, fucking... I was more upset I'd let me, me mentors down, you know? But by the time I'd got up from them, picked myself up, dashed myself off, my phone rang. You fucking, what you done there? He'd been told. I said, I, he said, listen. He said, I'm going to make a call, I'll ring you back. He rang me back, he went, Dean, I made a few calls, Gee's a prick, he's a known prick. Right, he's one of my people. He said, don't fuck it, I said, I'll back my job. Oh, fuck. He said, don't worry. So then the main man rings me up, gives me a bike in first of all. I just said, look, I'm really sorry. I said, look, don't pay me this week. That's how I was. Mm. Like, I felt uh, mm. punished me, you know? So I said, don't be fucking silly. He said, I'm going to move on another job. So he put me in another job and um, we were finishing off and um, he put me foreman. Yeah? 21 years old. Foreman. I had four bricklayers, Mark, always between 40 plus. And he sat me down and he said, Dane, look, listen, you've got a bit of a name for yourself, blah, blah, blah. I don't like bullies. Do not bully. Just get on with your work. I was fucking so surreal. And I remember having problems at work and ringing up my mentors down, like, how do I set this out? And they were guiding me through it, you know? And I got through. And it just propelled from there, you know? Got a taste of supervision. I've got a taste of setting out and running the men. I was very good running men, you know, a good man management, mm -hmm. you know, it, getting the best out of the men. And then uh, my next job, the gang got big. And um, before I knew it, I was doing all my own work, running gangs. And it was like the old school way, Mark. You know, I had a bell, an old bell. Every tea time, I'd ring the bell, beep, 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 and that was a tea, you know. On a Friday, when you heard a bell ring on a Friday up, and then that meant job and knock. So use the muck up. Everyone's going, Wee! ring the bell, and we'd all fucking work like, you know. And in the days, the, the lawyers would turn up with the bricks. They now thought this then. Mm. Just hand all the bricks off. Mm. Every man, big chain. Boom. I'm talking about unloading like 3,000, 4,000 bricks on a Friday up and own. And that was it, down the pub, watch the strippers, you know, and football couldn't be a part of that life. Mm. It just couldn't possibly be, so. Just polar opposites, isn't it? Oh. Yeah, and you're caught in between two yeah. worlds. So, things were pushing on really well with the, uh, with the, with the brick land, and then what happened was, we, um, I got the years to play football again. I was 21, 22, you know. So I went over to this non-league side, a very really well-known ex-pro, Brian Hall, run a local semi-professional side manager. Mark, I had a, probably a four or five ounce gold chain. Imagine it, can't you? White vest, work boots on. And the train went up to us and said, all right, I'll come out with a trial. 
He looked at me. I said, reserve of train over there. Look yourself train. I thought, this guy's a fucking room. You know who I am. Like, you know, that's how it was. <laughs> Fuck, he put me in the reserves. I mean, he thought well, that's an insult. Yeah, of course. I looked at him and just smiled. I thought, I'm going to fucking love this. Mark, I played three games in reserves. The fucking club phone was ringing galore. Clubs, clubs, clubs. He sat me down and changed him. We had a, a, a League Two side come in. And he said, uh, I went with the first team this week. Good mate. He said, uh, you've had some good games, blah, blah, blah. A lot been going on, but a lot of interest. He said, you didn't tell me you, you used to play football, blah, blah, blah. He said, so I went you Saturday in the first team. It's time. I went for I said, fuck you. <laughs> and he went, shocked from the assistant. I said, what, didn't you hear me, right? I said, you fucking mugged me off. So I turn up. I said, listen, let me listen to you in football. You're an ex-pro. You was one of my idols. I said, you fucking mugged me off. You could be, you don't know who you're talking to. Respect everyone. You mugged me in the reserves. I said, I'll stay with the reserves, thank you. I said, tell them clubs to stick it. I'm staying with the reserves. That's what I've done. Then the reserve man just said, Fam, said, I can't have you playing, Dean. They've told me not to play you. Because the club were trying to earn a bit of money out of me. Mm. By, it's only about a grand then back then. To transfer over, and I said, "Really? So I love playing for you. So I don't even money. I'm working during the week doing well. This is my release." In the end, I caved in. I went to another side and just moved on the ladder as far as I could as part-time football, and had a and had a fucking smashing career. But you know, the things I've done in non I tell you. I'd go in that dressing room, Mark. Again, that manager is now my family. I'm willing to die for that. For, and I'll I choose his words wisely. I'm willing to die for this geezer in that 90 minutes. I've run for a wall for him because he's shown loyalty and respect in training me and, and picking me. And if my team went on the same wavelength as me, that was it. They, they got it. You know. Standard football. Meet at half one. You have a chat in the dressing room. Start getting changed. You're on the pitch of 10 past two, warming up. You come back in at 20 to three, get padded up, out for three o'clock kickoff. Talking about last night antics, you know, girls, blah, blah. Come two o'clock, that was me, cut the throat. Hey, fucking that's it, fellas. We switch on now. We start thinking about our first touch. Hey, fucking come on. Let's start thinking about it, getting that fucking zone. Walking around to a youngster, he's sitting there, I'd slap him around the face. I'd tell him, listen, come on, boy. This is your day today. Hey, come on, lads. And that's what I fucking thrive on. That um, that camaraderie, that leadership in that room, fucking getting them up there. You know, win, lose, or draw, we're going to go out and fucking compete. I'll say one thing about you, Dean, that yeah. I've learned. I, I, what we've known each other, seven, eight years, something like that. Probably. Yeah, longer than that. Yeah, baby, yeah. Probably longer than that. Yeah. The one thing I've learned about you is... I think you're one of the most likeable guys out there. Oh, was <laughs> A lot of oh, women but... disagree with that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think you are. I think you've got something about you. I don't know what it is, but you've got an aura about you that you, yeah. people are drawn to you. You're, you're quite a likeable guy. I've been in your football academy and talking to a lot of the parents of the kids that are there. Everyone sings your praises. You know, Dean's fantastic with this. Dean's great with the kids. Dean's a, a yeah. you know a really nice guy. Plus, I think your leadership as well. You you seem to be quite a born leader. You want to be, you don't want to be the guy in the background there following somebody else. You know, you're yeah. you're the shepherd if you like. You're you're the one that that is the leading, and that goes back to you know like what you were saying about being a ganger at twenty one. Yeah, yeah. You know your mates doing the landings. That was all part of you know your idea and that. I think that's a, a wonderful trait to have, considering you never had a role model as a kid. Yeah, but I think if I look at that, Mark, because I didn't have that, and I know what I had done to build in playing ball games on my own, Mark, what's that about? But I think a lot of people, if they don't have role models, they fall by the wayside. Yeah, There's no yeah, one that they could look right, up yeah. to. There's no one mentoring them through, through life. But I think because I'd done that, I didn't have that, I could identify that in others. Mm. So I would, like, 
you could. This is how I am, and I don't know how I've come like it. If there's three men in the room and all our dads have just died, I'd be consoling them too. Mm. I'll put other people first, I'll lead, because I know how they would feel. Mm. And I think that comes from me being young, Probably. being like that, mm. identifying people looking vulnerable. So we would be in a dressing room and I would be fucking, hey, this is fucking time, fellas. This is fucking time. Mark's first game of the season. <laughs> <laughs> Gaffer just knows but I was employed for that in my later years I was a bit fucking I wouldn't take no shit you know um, you go in the players tunnel and this is what I used to love fucking love it players tunnel referee get the two teams in the players tunnel before he leads you out a bit quiet everyone's banging the hey come on fellas come on fellas the opposition are lined up next to you come on fellas they're skipping this game I look around I'm going Fucking come on, you prick. Look at the state of you, you fucking idiot. What are you fuck? What are you fucking... And it all go off before we've even gone out on the bitch. <laughs> so I've really got in their heads, do you know what I mean? That thing. Oh, I'd stand and go, these are not up for it today. Look at the fucking... Some of these geezers like that, right? Look, who are you talking to? Look at that. Like, they don't want to fucking know. Look at them. Some managers, they didn't like me for doing that. Some love me. Mm. But... It worked, Mark, because you get on the pitch and they'd be so angry at the try. Once they get angry, you own them. Their technical place that would go, you know. After the thing, you want a beer, fella? It's all right. They'd be like, you're fucking low. I went, no, it's fault, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Playing a game, yeah. But um, I was playing a game for, uh, I'll tell you this story quickly. Oh, my God. This is one of them. Because, again... I'm trying to be in a disciplined environment, but every now and then. Listen, big personalities are hard to manage, but big personalities win your games. Mm. It takes a real man to employ a big personality because he's not insecure himself. Some managers are a little bit, hence why at the moment Man United are struggling. Too many big egos, you know. Um, playing a game. Well known footballer, his cousin, right? 70 30 challenge. In my favour. Leaves his foot in. Get up and sit, you fucking prick. Spits at me, right? <laughs> Fuck. So I'm... What the fuck's just happened? So I'm walking down the pitch. Everyone's come in between. Ref's calmed down. So ref, let me fucking top the spit on it. He's gonna... Calm down, keeper. I said, you're joking me, ref. Right. So... Their manager knows me from old. He knows what's going to fucking happen, right? Dino, Dino, I said, do yourself a favour, Damon. Take him off, because I'm going to smash him and whoever's near him at half time. Oh, Dino, come on, come on. I said, I'm telling you, this game's going on. Didn't take him off, right? So I played my centre half, and mate Shavesy, good lad. Always got my back. I know of his as well. Delayed it. Gone over, and uh, I've timed him walking into the players' tunnel. Fella, bum, smashed him, right? All gone off in the tunnel. All got separated. Broken up, shimmied back into our dressing room. I'm now kicking off with my team. I'm going to them, fucking, when we have a, what did I say? When we have a row, we all go. See, you, referee can't just send one person, you can't send all 11 players off. If you all get stuck in, you get away with it. So I'm kicking off. Anyway, ref pulls me out half time. Keep back, he's calmed everything down. Took me in a tunnel. He said to me, uh, I said, ref, if you send me off, it's gonna go. He said, pulled the red straight out. I've turned around, I've kicked their change room door up and gone in there, Mark. Pa, 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 pa. It's fucking melee's happening, what? Fucking people flying out, fucking everywhere. So I'm, Mark, I'm not gonna lie, I fucking love all that. <laughs> If you're a man and you ain't been in the brawl like that and enjoyed it, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and I know I sound like a bit of an idiot, but it's boys being boys. Fans, from because of the tunnel, they were leaning down, grabbing me. I was grabbing fans down, fucking bum, gone. Anyway, five minutes on, so fucking what's happened? The referee, Mark, is on the floor twitching. He's knocked out, hasn't he? Which is bad. Because if he's injured as a result of your fracard, your life ban. Mm. 
game gets a ban, old Bill turn up. I'm out the back door. This is over at Barley A12 at the stadium. <laughs> Find me mate up. He's picked me up around the corner. I'm running down the fucking mic with my bag on my shoulder. I just get away. Do you know what I mean? And um, that was it. The club disowned me. FA got involved. Got a life ban. National newspapers ringing me up. No comment. No comment. Um, I was fucked. I spoke to my club. I said, why have you banned me? And they went, we have to be seen to be doing the right thing. So the guys spat at me. I said, you're not AC Milan. You're fucking with an OFC. Like, you're playing in the Ryman North or whatever it was. I said, you know what? Fuck you. So I left it. So you had a life ban. In football, yeah. In football. Yeah. So then, five days later, Gaffer rings me up from the AFC Sudbury. Dino. Mark Moore's the AFC Sudbury. He said, right, what's happening? They're top of the league flying. He said, we want to sign you. Get you out of this shit. I was like, you do know what's going on, what's pending at the minute, my case and all that. He went, we'll sort it all out. Got a barrister. Took me to the FA, right? And because the FA's a, a, a private institution, they've got their own laws. Mm. So civil, doesn't matter. But my barrister was clued up. Took him in there, blah, blah, blah. Turned around and said, listen, you didn't have enough stewards at the game. Your players' tunnel was undersized, which it was, by 500 mil. The door from the bar to the players' tunnel was open. Should have been locked. He said, Mark like Miss Neil could have been stabbed. He's fighting for his life. He said, fans are jumping over fan drinks and you're banning him for a year, like life ban. The FA said, I've never seen people at a big committee table, Dan Solo, where it used to be. I, I saw him shrink, Mark. Shrink. I was sitting here. And they left the room, sent us out. And um, my sister had come back in and he said to me, uh, admit to this, you're going to get a four-game ban, grand fine. Like, are you fucking serious? He said, yeah. And my club said, we're paying you fine. And within two weeks, because four games, we've done mm. two games a week, I was back playing. But what I didn't want was I've now propelled. The fans fucking love me. I'm like the rogue. and <laughs> They've all nicknamed me the monk. Have you seen Moon Machine? <laughs> yeah. The monk. Honestly, we've signed the monk. We it went, That was it. I weren't d new anymore. I was the monk. So being a bit young, I thought I'd play up to this. Fucking hell. <laughs> but what memories? You know, and um, yeah, it, and then like, it, it's sad. I miss it now. I can't replace that because that my football days were my family. I was fighting for my team in there. If someone didn't pull their weight, we had them. If someone done well, we fucking loved them. You know, we had a paid night out once, becoming a half time losing one nil. I wouldn't have thought we'd have gear on the coach who was going straight after. I said, tonight's off. I said, if we are not fucking going out, me and my mate Shavesy, you fucking, how can we go out and celebrate the night losing a fucking game? We cannot lose this fucking game, boys. Mate, he's part I said, fuck you, we're all going off in the changing room. Fuck it, we went out and won 3 1, Mark. <laughs> that night was better. I got a cab home with two birds, back to Rockland. I thought I did all this. Um, but that's what it was about, you know, the men, the, the losing, the winning, you know, and. Since retiring, that's a massive hole in my life. Play golf. Fucking golf. How the fuck am I going to get that winning mentality? Mm. You know, the emotion of losing, you know, the emotion of winning. What do you do? So, so me, me, me and you met through a mutual friend of ours. Mm. And uh, the reason that we met is that you wanted some filming done that's for right, yeah. uh, an academy that you'd opened up yeah. for young young gentleman to want to be aspiring goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how did that even come about that you'd done that? <laughs> because obviously you'd had this amazing whirlwind career in football. Yeah. You'd done a bit on the trail as well, but now you're coaching. Yeah, but what happened was, uh, tell the truth, recession hit in 2009, 2008, and I had a very successful building company. You know, I was I worked for big guns. And I was finding myself passing jobs just to keep men in work. And then the worst thing they'd done, Mark, was take the piss. 
I was struggling to keep them in work, just keep their wages. They were leaving early. And in the end, no matter how long I had them for, I cut the folk on it. I cut down to just doing extensions, driveways and garden walls. And then I was, um, one lad at football asked me if I could coach his boy. I was like, it worse coaching kids, Mark. Bad, you know, like going back then, I'd be like, but I really enjoyed it. And then, um, God rest his soul, Dick Marshall, an old reporter for the local newspaper, he used to always interview me after games when I played locally. And he said about me coaching. And off, off record, he went, when you do coaching, let me know, I'll do a piece in the paper for you. I said, what do you mean? He said, like, if you do a day course or something. And it all fell in. So the session hit hard, and I'd done a day course. And when it was a session, people always got money for their kids. So I'd done this day course, might advertise it. Dick done a bit for me. 62 keepers turned up. At £15 a head. I was on the phone to everyone I know, Tom, Dick and Harry, even if you weren't a goalkeeper, get your boots on, pretend that you are. Get the hell here. Because there's two of us with 60 kids. I've got odd carriers, man, there. Mark Gloves on again. <laughs> like, but I said, Look, don't worry, I'll dictate the session. So I'll set the sessions up and you just repetitively serve. And then from there, I really enjoyed it. Everyone was contacting me about privates, one-on-ones, blah, blah, blah. And the trail game was for the the day rate had gone stupid. You couldn't survive on it, mm. you know. So it was hard. I gave the trail up. And do you know what? It's like I lost my identity. Mm. It fucking hit me hard, man. Really hard. Because I've gone from this geezer on site, like running jobs, doing this free, the strippers, the birds, you know. And then to just coaching like kids, having to be professional. Didn't want them to see certain sides of me, protecting certain sides. And he went from there and, and uh, no one, there was no one about doing what I, as good as what I was doing with the coaching. I was looking at his coach, those old school and boring, just hadn't turned the page. Now with me as a keeper playing, only five foot ten, I come from an area where you had to be tall. There was no right that I should have been playing football at that level. But I was very good at reading the game, assessing it, risk assessing. So I implemented that on the goalkeepers. I set up this syllabus. And before I knew it, within 12 months, I had 100 St. Boys sign at pro clubs. So I thought, well, I must be doing something. How many thing. kids did you have coming through the academy? Because when I went, it was fucking mobbed. Yeah. Uh, when you come, we, we, um, I sourced an indoor venue. I went to train. I got fed up relying on the, the weather and other people's premises. So I leased an indoor facility, converted it, and now I'm on my own boss. I can train when I want, when I want, where I want, you know. And at one point, 200 goalkeepers a week plus, you know, and of them 200, 70% were at a very good level, you know. Not to mention the out-of-contract pros come in during the day that we were training, the college stuff that I was doing. Um, Got multiple offers from pro clubs to go and work. I worked in a few, I worked in Arsenal, uh, Dagenham and Redbridge. Um, but again, I haven't got the patience for Wallies. With everything in life, Mark, we can be good, but we need to turn the page. If we don't turn the page, we get left behind. And in coaching, it's the same format. If our premiership is so full up with foreign import of players and talent, what are we doing? to learn from that. So we need to be coaching our coaches, looking at their blueprint, so we can coach our coaches, so our coaches can coach our children. So babies born of 2022, by the time they're, that's our good England team in, in 2050, you know, or 2040. And I weren't seeing that from the top. I just wasn't seeing it. So I set up in an independent association, so I wasn't affiliated with any major organisation. So that meant then that I could make my own rules. I didn't have to do certain licenses that I didn't agree with. It was all my own licenses that we created. Even the first day, Mark, the FA, go on your level two course, first day course is three hours. It's pathetic. My first day course is three days. If you're gonna work under me and there's an accident, we're gonna do our utmost best to save that person or provide that, that that level of safety. Three days, Mark, my health and safety course. 
right? My first aid, sorry. So how can they come at me? You know, say, look, listen, we're willing to listen to you, but we won't do what you, you're telling us because we don't have to. So, yeah, it become very big, you know, and um, what I've done now is I spot me when I was younger. Mm. And I get hold of them kids and I'll discipline them, you know, and give them a strict regime and get the best out of them. Do you have a lot of um, like unprivileged children come yeah. through yours? Or is it... Yeah. Or is it like more affluent uh, guys that come your way? Uh, a lot of working class. Mm -hmm. And then we've got... I'm a bit of a soft touch. A lot of single mums uh, come in. And it's hard for them. And I do sponsor some of them. You know? Because when you've got a talent, money shouldn't come into it. Although it does. It shouldn't. And I'm a, I'm a gentleman, Mark, if, you know, if it's coming from somewhere, why can't we help? And that goes back to me sharing the sweets out, identifying mm. that. Everyone mm. deserves a chance in life, no matter what you are, where you come from, colour of your skin or whatever you are. You deserve that chance. And I think a lot of clubs, when I was younger, they didn't look at it like that, you know? So I'm really, as a coach, of just took negatives, turned them into positives. And, they, and when I'm sitting and talking to you, it, it, like the penny's dropping. I think, well, I'm doing that because that's why. And I've never even thought about it like mm. that before. But there's times like, Mark, I drive and I see me as a kid, like me. Memories come back. And I want to pull over and give myself a cuddle and say, listen, lad, it's going to be all right. Mm. Um, yeah, it'd be fucking emotional to my head, so okay. but, but yeah, um, I see him and I, I and I see him often, and all the um, oh, fucking hell. all the uh, oh, fucking hell. I'm gonna cut this bit out, Mark, boy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, like, and I feel like saying to him, "It's gonna be all right." You can do the right thing. Because I, I didn't know that I was lost then, what I was doing. But look at where I am now. I could say to myself, this is all part of your learning. It's all life. You're going to be all right. And that's where I've got to now in, in life. I'm secure. You know, um, with COVID hit, the football took a big bang. And Mark, like, I'm not going to lie, I was biggest in Europe. You know, I worked in Spain for seven years teaching coaches to be coaches um slovenia italy worked across the board worked with some amazing pro club worked with some amazing people and uh liked and disliked for me straight talking don't take no shit from people and i think not selling smoke is the way to be choose truth over sensitivity mm -hmm. a lot of clubs choose sensitivity over truth and um like it's hard at least I mean guys watching this now are going to think I'm brutal I watched a podcast the other day kids being released from football at 16 um, and it's a lot of pressure for kids to deal with mental health issues and they've been in the club and clubs need to do more and I think are you fucking joking me are you having a fucking laugh the boy's 16 years old how you see you're the one damaging that fucking kid. He's been released from football, so what? You're going to get sacked. Keep him at 16, getting sacked or from your sacky job. There's no fucking difference. The problem is the fucking parents talking up the fucking kid. Do you see what I mean? Oh, my son, my little Jimmy's this and that. You've been released from a football team at 16. But now this society's, and I don't believe this, Mark, this society's set up, cashed in on it. Telling you that you're going to be ill if you get released at 16. You get released at 16, you spend a week in bed upset. Just like your bird dumped you, isn't it? Week upset, then you get yourself back on your feet. You're back out there. And now it, we, we're in a world where it's so softened in football. Oh, you've got to be careful. What institutionalised, like, come on, you're 16 years old. Does that mean the end of your career? How many players I know have been dropped and come back and gone into top flight of football? 
So instead of man be pandering these kids at 16, teach them resilience, teach them to get over it and fucking get back in there. Otherwise, they will play on it, you know? Mm. Mm. And I get a lot of, oh, we're, um, what was the other, I don't want to name a company, we're this company, can we come and do a, um, a seminar talk on pressures of football being released? I said, no, you fucking can't. <laughs> I said, no, because I, I breed men in my place. Winning, you can smile when winning. You know, it's not about taking part. And if my men foul and they fall down, they fucking get back up. And I think that that terminology went out of football and it needs to come back. Hence why we struggle as an England side, national side. Hence why managers are losing control over the top sides because the ego. I've got a player. <laughs> Jess from a long time ago. Walks in, geezer. Louis Bag under his shoulder, fucking Rolex on and all this. Sits down next to me. Um, I'll lean across my and I say to him, Listen, geezer, you're in my world now. Fuck all that off. Don't come in and give it a fucking digging. You know? Or if he's got a different colour pair of boots on, put black ones on. Right? You're not, well, I'm not walking out of you with fucking yellow boots on. Yes, you are some sort of baller scoring 100 goals a year with AC Milan after you. You're not mugging my team off. And that's how I was, very mm. humble. Mm. And I come from a world, Mark, where I believe in uh, vertical and horizontal living. Now, vertical living is vertical leaders. Pecking order. You respect authority. You respect your leaders. You know? You try and work your way up to the top. Whereas now, I believe football society is horizontal. There's no leaders, there's no respect for leaders, no respect for authority. You've got matey, he probably weighs about 16 stone, can't get the ball for life, having a go at fucking David Beckham. Should have done this, should have done that. Like, unless you can do it, don't criticise. And that comes from my upbringing and just the way I am mentally. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a place for that men mentality in football no more. So then, COVID... Covid hit that fucking dreaded, yeah, dreaded fucking thing that we had. Um, yeah. And because of Covid, obviously a lot of us had to adapt to different ways of earning a living. Yeah. Uh, for us, I was telling you before the podcast, I had to sort of revert back to my old my old trade of tree surgery and mm. and other bits and pieces just to get by because obviously we we couldn't do this. Everything shut down for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, you couldn't do the academy because you're all under one roof yeah. in a confined space. So yeah. it fucked you a bit yeah. in that sense. But then you went and picked up the trial again. Oh, WHS, 100%. And I'm just going to say something <laughs> here for the record. So we, we run a media company, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> your, when you sent me your um, like stats for traditional bricklayer on Instagram, yeah. the other day, I was fucking blown away with what you've managed to do in such little time with your social platforms. Yeah. It's unheard of. There ain't many people that get <laughs> through <laughs> like you on, on something like this. I don't know what the fuck you've done or how you've done it or whatever, but we were showing it to some of our staff members the other day and, and saying, you know, look, this guy's done this organically. There's nothing paid in this. This is all just off his own back that he's done it. Mm. Some of your videos are getting like 200,000 views, quarter of a million views, things like that. It's crazy. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is because of your normal. Yeah. And your old school. Yeah. And obviously you've been away for a long time from yeah, Brick Lane yeah. and then come back into it. So it's like you've time stopped for you and then you've just had to come back yeah, into yeah. it and wake up into it. Yeah. It's, um... So what's changed over them? Oh, what did you say? Ten years you was at? It was yeah, like... ten years. All I'd done was the odd friend's garden wall because I do actually love Brickland, Mark. I'm an out and out Brickland. Therapeutic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I am an out and out. It's in me. I'm an out and out Brickland. I've put capital gold on me and Trail cigar brick. I won't stop. You feed me, I'll go. I just love it. Um, nah. I tell you what's changed, and I think I don't know. Listen, people ask me about like what you've just asked me, this and that. My boy come up to me and said, Dad, we had to go back on the trail, earn some money, keep the place alive, me football. And um, 
He said, oh, Dan, I'm going to put an Instagram YouTube. I said, no, what's his brick layer? Football, yeah, he, I've got loads of views of football. What's his? He showed me, I said, fucking hell. I couldn't fucking believe it. I was watching Brick Lads, Mark, on a huge Instagram. They wouldn't have gotten my face work with my, with my men that I had. They wouldn't have lasted two tea time. And these men were pulling in thousands of views. Put that, I was looking, I was thinking, they really put this work up online. And then I was reading some of the comments and nothing against them. It not, it's not personal. What's, what's the sort, what is the following? Is it other bricklayers? Yeah. So then, my boy had done it. And me being me, you're probably talking for this interview, you know I am. I don't take, the world's gone fucking mad, Mark. 12 years being in the freezer coming on, I'm working with geezers. And I'm fucking like, I just think, um, you know, there's more and more women in the trade now. You know, and they're having a big say. And I'm looking at it and I think, well, when did that fucking happen? Because I'm old school, you know. So I started looking at a few bits and I changed a few of them, you know. And I just think, I don't know what, I'd, I'd just be me. I don't take no shit. If a woman's piping up on a job, I'll fucking tell her. Get back in your lane. I had an interview a woman uh, on a thing for Instagram. Piping up she was. Pink eye, everyone's got yellow eye visits on. Guess what colour she's got? Pink. Look at me, I'm a girl bricklayer. I'll see past that. I'll see through it all. I said to her, she's strapping away and I said, women make up less than 1% of the bricklaying trade. In my eyes, you ain't got a fucking say. If you want a glass fucking ceiling, make sure you've got a glass floor. What do you mean by that? I said, of your 1% in the bricklaying trade, how many of you have gone and got an apprenticeship, like I did, went and got a start, got sacked, got bullied, got, I don't know, bullied again, got a start, sort of the earth? 0.3%, because 0.7 come in between their dads or their families. So really, I'm only talking to 0.3% mark of the trade who have come in the sort of the earth way, like we'll have, do you know what I mean? And I said, I've got no problem with your gender. But when you're using your gender as a platform and disrespect hardworking class men, that's when I've got a fucking problem. And what, what are they doing to disrespect? Is it what they're saying? Is it? Yeah, like woman builds brick wall on her video. Woman, not enough women in the trade. Like some of these women can't even lay a fucking good face brick. It's all social media piping them up. I've got no problem with a woman laying bricks, but don't use your gender because when they're using their gender, they are the ones being sexist. And I won't have it in my trade. You know, I'm fucking, I love my trade. Then I turned to the, uh, the host. I said, why you got on here? I'm with, I said, you've got on here to up your platform. I said, what about the 65 year old man who's been working since 13 years old on the trail? Why have you got him on here? Because he's not sellable. Why haven't you give him free boots, a free trail? Look, we spoke to your governor, they had a whip round, you've got a week off, thank you for your services. No one's appreciated. And I've seen that, as I've come back, I've seen that us old school are deemed as wrong and outed. And I'm not having it. I'm not buying it, I'm not selling it. I won't have it. And there's a couple of girls I've talked to uh, right behind me. Are, 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 are there good uh, women bricklayers out there? There must be. Yeah, well, listen, there's a very, very mind few. But, Mark, listen, if you want to talk about equality and you want to talk about um, equal rights, then field every trade, not just the financial sector. Ground working. Go and dig footings, girls. Yeah? Go lay bricks. Go be carpenters. Go be plumbers. Don't blame me, I'm making a clear statement. For the noise you're making, what I don't want, Mark, is arch working man's trade to be tarnished with politics and equality in terms of, you know how it is in life now, you can't say certain things because you're either, you're either uh, far right, racist, patriotic or sexist. What the fuck? It's all gone crazy. And I won't have it in my trade. So what I've done is I'm at a place in time of my life, I'm at peace, I'm putting back on my Instagram, I'm giving back to the youngsters the way I learned. This is what you should be doing. This is what you should be proud of. 
remember who you are. This is what you're learning. It's an education. You're learning every day. And it's gone crazy. And the, the um, majority of the old school people are coming back going, it's great to have someone here who just speaks the truth. <laughs> and I'm even getting youngsters in there who come on and go, like, I love the, the way you just say things and the way your, your, your terminology of things, you know? So I'm not against anyone coming into the trade, but don't use it as a, as a platform, you know? Gain your followers for who you are, your skill set. Not because oh, I've got a pen here, this is a great pen, uh, promo codes below, say traditional bit like 25% off. They all do it, you know? Clothing companies, giving workwear to young 22-year-old bricklayers, males as well, advertised this. What about the boys been in 60 years? Like, what, we're just going to fucking neglect them? Typical today society, we just fucking, oh, not worry about him, he's not sellable, you know? And I think it's wrong. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've always known to be quite a, a good bricklayer and... Um, and now the world can see it because we're documenting it and we do lovely bits of creative work, you know, give genuine advice. Um, I don't sell on there, Mark, you know, if you want to. Do you know, we, we've uh, obviously we've been speaking a lot yeah. lately, you know, about this and, and some other bits and pieces as well, some other projects. But the, the, the thing that I actually like about you is you don't sell yourself. No. You ain't going to sell yourself short. Like you said about, you know, code promos or you know yeah. people sending you shit or anything like that i mean you've had some <laughs> you've had some quite big fucking uh yeah. things come through you on instagram which i probably would have jumped at yeah. you know but you ain't you're playing your cards very close to your chest yeah no fuck that no i'm not listen i'm not my soul's not for not not for sale mark even, even though the the instagram's gone fucking mental your youtube went crazy yeah. like one of your youtube videos that I saw when you was, because you're building your own house, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You was building the chimney stack. Yeah. I'm not a bricklayer, so I, I don't know the terminology of the way that you was laying the bricks. Yeah. Look fucking amazing. Five and a half million views. Yeah, crazy, yeah. On that. Yeah. That's um, crazy. Yeah, but you know what? The crazy thing about that, Mark, when you think about it, the, the, the probably percentage of men who have watched that is very high. I'll give it something like, I get messages from men saying, you inspire me, Dean. Do you know what I say? The most common one I get, I love, we all can lose our love for work. Man, did it 20, 30 years. Dean, lost my love. I want to say you actually inspire me. I said, I watch and listen to you on a Sunday night and I'm up at bed Monday at the door. And for a man to say, you inspire me, a bricklayer man who's self-employed, hardened, been through the mill, that's a big word to say. I choose mm. that word wisely, who I would say that to. And I think, fucking hell, you know? I, lo I like that you've turned it around so much. The young boy that wasn't mentored yeah, to now the men, oh. to being the mentor. Yeah, and it's like, they're calling me this, calling me that, and they're putting me up. And, and you know, like, listen, I don't know where it's going. I'm just, you know, I showed you the message earlier earlier today you know i've got two tv channels on me at the minute i've got another broadcasting company i want me to go and present it i'll be front page of the something about a month mark if i got hard time for tv <laughs> you've got joking. this amazing platform Come yeah on. there no you man. go <laughs> uh, but do you know what um i love britland i'm writing a book at the minute um i'm about five chapters in and with a britland book a standard britland book you open it and it's got your, your measurements, your gauges, how to do technical, your learning. I didn't want to just put that in there. So what I've done is I've put my life experiences in the book so they can read and learn the times I've failed, the times I've treated men wrong, the times I've treated them good, the times I've got stabbed in the back. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And I think people would learn from that more. So the... I mean, the book was going to go out in uh, spring, but I'm going to delay it because I'm really enjoying it. There were so many stories. Like, a thing with Brick Landmark, when you're an improver, right, how do you know when to ask more money? How do you know when you want to leave the gang and be on a child full-time because mm. you kept being put on the odd, you know? 
all right? You're working on day work. You want to go on price now. Your first employees. How do you price your first job? How do you get the work? How do you do? And I've just put down what I've done, what worked for me. And um, that's just generally what I do on Instagram. I give and I try to answer all the messages, but I get seen and dated and I feel bad, you know? Um, and the main thing about it, Mark, I have a laugh. Mm. That's typical me. I can switch, be saying, for, give you a, a tip, a bit of information. You think, well, the next minute I can have a laugh with it. And I think, that's the brick layer and you're always trying to, it comes from younger days. Banter, isn't it? It's, yeah. it uh, and a lot of people don't understand uh, banter. No. Like how it was years ago and yeah. you're implementing that to people nowadays and they see it as either rude or they don't understand it or oh, they don't get don't it. Even go there. Oh. it. It's, it's crazy. We, uh, we got, even with our children, I'm, I'm a I'm a born piss taker. Yeah, I love yeah. it. I love the banter anyway. I used to love it on the building. I've been yeah. on a building site since I was 13. So fucking, I yeah. love it. So I bought my um, I bought my my girl up as part of that yeah, banter. Yeah. I can say anything to her. It just fucking falls. I thought, like, oh, right, dad, whatever. And then she gives it back to me. Yeah. I've got another one who hasn't been brought up in that environment. Yeah. Just don't get it. Nah. Don't get it. I just doesn't understand banter. I love it. I still fucking give it to her. Do you know what I mean? Because I, yeah, I think it's good to do it for yeah, them. Yeah, but don't you think it's the school system? No, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't, I'm not sure if it's the school system or not. I'm not sure. I think it obviously where where we've come from and how we've grown up oh, has a lot to do to with that. A, Mark, I swear to you have a day, boy. If your kid is being taught equality at school, pull them out. I homeschooled both my boys. Pull them out. That teacher's job, and I hope you're all listening to teachers or whatever, is to teach maths, English or science. Your job is not to teach my boy that Adam used to be Steve or Steve used to be Adam. Eve used to be bloody Steve. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Your job is to teach less. My job as a parent is to teach the ways of life, right? It got mixed up. It almost comes to the point, Mark, that equality is racist, right? It comes to the point now if you're straight white working class male, you're fucked. And I fucking had nothing of it. I'm not racist. I've got friends of different cultures. But when you're made to feel that it's wrong to be white and working class and straight, we've got fucking problems. We've got issues. And in my child's school, you'd walk in, for example, IGBT or whatever it is, good, thumbs up, yeah? Uh, something with the religion, the, I think it's the Muslim religion or whatever, ethnics, respect, values and stuff. Nothing up there. Okay to be white. We're a dying breed. The white working class males are dying. And I'm going to tell you something now. It's factual. I was. I wouldn't be saying it. We're a dying breed. The schools don't like you. They don't want the masculine male. Everything's offensive now, right? I was working in my college, and I was doing a contract update, and the education representative was coming kept using the term to me, uh, WWM. And I'm sitting there, like, boy, I can't even tell you, no clue what's going on. I'm winging it, making out, I understand it. And sure, it's imperative that Mr. Neil's contract's renewed with a rate of what percentage increase? So I think, fuck you, Neil. What's going on here? Like, I've never read this before. And what WWM means is white working class male. I attract the white working class male and the schooling system have betrayed the white working class male, the underprivileged white working class male for the last 30 years, Mark. There's a dossier gone out. And you know when they released it? On the day England played Scotland in the Euros. Clever. So people's minds went elsewhere, right? Now you can go on it, you can go and look it up online, whatever, you can read through it. Because they had to be seen doing something for the girls or the ethnics, which I, I get, everyone needs help. But when you're grouping and leaving one group neglected because your target is on two other groups, that's fucking racist towards us whites. And for me to come on here and say that, it's factual. 
The way it was, the students I attracted was mate was ninety nine percent white working class males because in the college system, they're dropping out. They don't want to be there, and they're going into the lower rated jobs. So there's a big thing the government are doing the education. They're trying to twist it round, and it's bad. And I looked at this dossier for thirty years, Mark underprivileged white kids were not getting the attention that they needed because attention was focused elsewhere. So I pulled my boy out. There was something that went on at school. He was up for, oh, because he won, my boy won the fight. A boy tried to nick his phone. He had a shank with him. Fair enough. School phone. I said, punish him. I've got my support. Two, three days later, that boy gets an older boy and a few others to put it on my son. My son's come home and told me, and I said, well, I'll tell you two things, son. One as a dad, one as a father. As a dad, go to the mall, wait till he's on his own, smash him. He's three years old and you do not stop until you get pulled off. Because obviously where I come from. Yeah. As a father, walk away, son. So at 13 years old, I let him make that decision himself. Quarters nine next day, I've got a phone call, Mark, two teachers in the hospital. The kid's badly done. Smashed up, right? Fucking what's happened, dear? So, gone down to school. The teacher's gone to break it up. Sammy slipped the teacher. So the teacher's rolled, fell over, hit his head on the wall. The woman teacher's then rolled over him, discarded her shoulder. So my boy hadn't done nothing. But what the boy had done is put his hands up. Because my boy boxes. So I've gone down to school. I said, because uh, my boy boxes. What, because he trains four or five nights a week? Goes out running. You're trying to sit here and punish me, punish him for that. Well, yeah, we think it was race, blah, blah, blah. And I went, it's gang related. We ain't got no gangs here, Mr. Neil. I said, my boy has a fight with a 13 year old. That 13 year old recruits two 16 year olds to then intimidate my son. That's gang related. And I said, then nine come over to him. More than three's a gang. My child's welfare was jeopardised and compromised by you. So I'd be with joy, my son. He won't be attending school anymore. So I took him out, homeschooling, Mark. Two and a half years, online. Right? And I'm going to say this truthfully now, and I'm not encouraging anyone to do it. Right? <laughs> Four hours a week, Mark. Yeah, I know. Four hours a week, he's past his GCSEs. He done them in January, set him early. Mm. Teacher phone me up, so I'm going to put him forward for GCSEs. Four hours a fucking week. What are they doing in school the rest of the time? Learning these, what I call stupid lessons, what are not going to go with them as they get older. Is that the legal requirement as well? It's four hours a week? No. It had to be more. What have we done? We've got a plan. I'll give the teacher a little bum. We sort of that sent it to the, the education board, you know. And I'm going to be truthful. But you know what I did teach my boy? The ways of working. I let him go out to work. Then we got grassed up because he was working. I had to get a permit for him and all that. It's ridiculous. Couldn't be in the skip lorry. Couldn't be outside the skip lorry. Someone had to found the time and com like, complain. So I'd done all the right way, done all the right things. He went to work with all other people, learning the ropes, learning, dealing with men, dealing with situations, you know. And he's doing it. Both of them doing it ever so well. Both still box. Both gentlemen, both really well known around the area, being nice, you know, sporty, look after their bodies. Um, I couldn't, couldn't ask no more of them. But yeah, uh, that was the whole thing. And we're sad about the way the, the world's gone. And in the trade, I'm not, not that I can do it on my own, but my message is, if you follow me or not, my message, this, this is how I look at it. This is what I'm doing. If you want to listen, listen. If you don't, get off my page. Someone put a comment the other day. He went, I was taught to build a corner, Mark. Brickwork corner. It's called siting, where we don't use a level. Pick the level up as less as possible. So use your eye, let your eye be your guide. I can build average a 10 course corner high without a level, and it can be gauge, plumb, within. I didn't know that's quite a skill. Just thought that was, because that's where I come from. The men used to do that. But today, you're like, I do it online and they're like, fucking that is unbelievable. Some geese are coming, you know, that corner's crooked. I replied to that, I said, you're following the wrong page, geezer. You, yeah, I don't want to follow this shit. Put away with me, see ya. 
That's what I'm like. I just I don't. Mm. So if people want to follow you, they follow you for who you are, not because you sell stuff or your this, that. I put a video up yesterday, me, me boxer shorts. I'm sitting in my caravan. I was taking my tea break. Me, a little smile, because sometimes I'm a bit awkward with the camera, and I'm like, yeah. put it in, man. But it's, it's, it's good. I'm going to ask you two questions. Go on, then. Two big questions, I think. Before you answer the questions, let me just explain, because people keep asking me this as well. Uh, I've got WHS on my knuckles. Mm -hmm. WHS is an old trail mark. goes back to the uh, early 1900s. And it's made English company called uh, William Hunt and Sons. And the steel was made in Sheffield. And um, typical economy changes. It's not made in Sheffield no more. Companies took it over. And the, let's just say the quality is lessened. So whenever you see me with a WHS trail, you're a bit of a geezer. Now, my WHS trail was passed down to me. I've had mine 25, uh, yeah, 25 plus years. The geezer had it 10 years before me. So online, I was like, oh, I love your trail. People identify it, you know, Brickland enthusiasts. But what the Brickland's done was um, convert the name, the slang, the WHS, William Hunt and Sons. It stands for work hard or starve. That's the slang. So I ain't tattooed on me hand. And because um, it's think it represents me, you know. Mark, there's people getting tattooed on their hands. I can't believe it. People getting tattooed on their knuckles. Sounds like I've got it. On this side, they're sending me photos. So complimented, humbled. I'm like, have I done that? Like, you know, it's crazy. But my boys know the saying, in bed, work hard or starve. Work hard. And that's, like, it's good. But yeah, go on, fire away these questions. Old morals, isn't it? Yeah, Old morals. 100%. Yeah, yeah. So my two questions are, mm. I think I know the answer to the first one. Oh. So if you, like what we said before with some of your coaching academy, you see yourself in yeah. a lot of them lads. What big, say like in one sentence, yeah. what advice would you give them? And the other one is, are you sharing all this publicity that you're getting, this wonders of the world that you're representing? Are you sharing this with somebody special? Um, uh, the first one would be, uh, whoever you are, whatever you're doing, whether it be football, Rick Lane or whatever. You be honest. Be resilient. And work hard or starve. Whatever you do. If you're a runner, footballer, basketball, netball player, accept the fouls, accept the no's. No is just a word. You can hear it a lot of times in your life. You know, so be honest, be resilient and work hard or starve. And my next one, what do you mean by sharing it with? Have you got a lady? Oh, fuck me. I had a girl banging at my door at two o'clock in the morning last night, Mark. I let her out. <laughs> <laughs> got you, didn't I? <laughs> I love that one. I was thinking, where the fuck was my wife at <laughs> two o'clock in the morning? <laughs> but, no, I'm only joking for you family sat there. Exactly me. Um, uh, no, I'm single. Dean, I just want to thank you for uh, your time for coming on here today. No, don't be silly. The, the, the conversations that we've always had yeah, have yeah. been fucking brilliant. You know, so yeah, it's it's an absolute pleasure. And thanks for your support with the channel. And no, and don't be silly. Well. Yeah, we'll, we'll plug it and push it for you, mate. And, I'm um, forever grateful. Thank you. Don't be silly. And listen, all bricklayers out there, God bless every trail. Work hard or staff. <laughs>